It's a bright and early morning, the Concord of America. Uh, our panelists, our esteemed panelists, I should say, are making their way up the central aisle like grand champions, gladiators. <laughs> we could have done better on the music. That's right. Give them a hand. Here we go. We thank you guys so much for coming here and being with us this morning. Um, Haggerty loves doing these seminars. This one we hope you're really going to enjoy. You guys have uh, placards there with your names on it to sit next to. It's a very complicated arrangement to get everybody sitting in the right place up here. And this is going to be some great entertainment for you. Wayne Carini coming on up also. <laughs> so we're going to be talking today about we never should have let it go. And when we talk about topics for these things over the years, this is one that we always just said, God, people love to hear the, the horror stories, the sad stories about why I got rid of a car, why I don't have it anymore. And so we've gathered some really great stories from these guys, and we're going to share those with you today. Backing up some of this, but purely for entertainment purposes, are some numbers. And so you're going to see some charts and graphs based on maybe what they were worth then, maybe what they're worth now. But I assure you, back when these cars were all bought, nobody was buying these for investment purposes. So it's just, it's just for fun, just to kind of travel along with. So uh, my name's Brad Phillips. I work for Haggerty. I'm our National Relationship Manager. I think that's my title this week. It's good. <laughs> I've had a lot of different titles at Haggerty over the years. Um, I'm proud to say that I've, I know the panel here very, very well. We've worked on these things quite a few times. You guys may have known some of these names as well. Dave Kinney here, directly on the port side of me. Dave owns a company called uh, US Appraisal out of Great Falls, Virginia. He is the founder and publisher of the Haggerty Price Guide, has been involved in classic cars for your whole life, we could basically say, and has been actively buying, selling, tracking values for at least 25 years, if not more. Dave's a good friend. I live out on the East Coast also. Um, Dave's also one of my favorite people because he likes rebuilding his houses and things as well as playing with cars. And uh, he ripped up a perfectly good tennis court at a house he bought to put another garage in. So I think we can all get on board with that. <laughs> Next is a, a guy that you've probably never heard of before, Wayne Carini. Um, who is enjoying his 12th year on Discovery Channel, or Velocity, with Chasing Classic Cars. <laughs> Wayne owns uh, F40 Motorsports. He's been involved in high-end restorations, finding cars, uh, helping manage collections for many years, um, has become an institution in the hobby. And everyone that knows him and has a chance to meet him says, what a gentleman. And I've never seen him not pose for a picture or shake a hand with a fan. And we've traveled a lot together over the last few years. And he's just a really great guy. And we're proud to have him here on our panel with us. Thanks, Wayne, for being here. <laughs> Next, Jeff Lane. Jeff Lane owns the Lane Motor Museum out of Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Jeff spent his, uh, his professional career as a mechanical engineer, has always been a crazy car nut. And the Lane Motor Museum has over 500 cars they're, it's a crazy esoteric collection of Eastern European micro cars, really everything odd. Um, he's pretty famous for showing up in a Peel Trident everywhere he goes, which is pretty fun. Um, and he balances out with a giant Lark, which is this huge military thing with tires as big as this screen. Um, Jeff and I have a really great history also because I used to live in Nashville and my Haggerty office was actually inside the museum. So every day I got tired of being on conference calls or whatever, I could just walk out into the museum and sort of sit on a bench and watch all this activity happening around me. And uh, from that relationship, Jeff used to let me borrow cars here and there. Um, you may notice in my bio, if you picked up one of these little pieces of paper at the front, one of the things I'm famous for is I tried to drive an Amphicar from Tennessee to Vermont in a great race back in 2011. It did not end well. Um, that was actually Jeff's Amphicar. And, I, and it wasn't my fault. I think we found it was a catfish in the transmission. So I cannot be blamed for that. It's not my fault. So moving on. We did figure out that I think I am even. For the cars I borrowed, I returned more of them in the same condition than destroyed. Two broken, two not broken. Two and two. Yes. Zero sum game. Moving not, on. Not that he's keeping score. Not that he's keeping score. Right, exactly. All right, our anchor position, Brian Raybold. 
Brian is a VP of Valuation for Haggerty. Great guy. This is the numbers guy. Um, and also, we made a note earlier, an aspiring owner of about a 1975 Volvo 164E. Mm -hmm. So if, any, if anyone sees <laughs> one ever, um, yeah, get in contact with me, because I haven't <laughs> found one in years. Need Brian, any parts? <laughs> What's up? Yeah. yeah. I've got an attic full of parts. The parts, yeah, I can piece the, one together. The parts are easy to find, a non-rusted one, not so easy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a wonderful story because he's trying to find one because that was a car he was squired around in as a child, right? Yeah. So you want to kind of find that again? Yeah. Good. First so one I, First one I uh, got to steer the steering wheel on. Very good. All right. So without further ado, um, I also want to mention Jonathan Stein in the back who is going to be helping press the magic button. So if you see me sort of gesticulating over here, I'm not losing it. I'm making signals back to Jonathan, who actually put these slides together and is instrumental in these presentations. So thank you very much, Jonathan, for all your work with this. So without further ado, let's get to the fun. Conquer of America. Next slide, please. <laughs> all right, so this is kind of how this is going to go. We're going to talk about our first car, maybe an instant remorse story when you knew it was a bad idea to have gotten rid of this car, uh, a financial misstep, and then Everyone has auto regrets. So we're going to kind of stick to these things. We're going to go about 45 minutes or so, and then we're going to leave time uh, at the end for Q&A. We have microphones that will become live, and they'll go to you. Do not ask questions before the mic gets to you, because we are also live streaming this. And we want to make sure that our audience out there on the grand interwebs can hear the question um, and answer just as well as everybody in the room. So we appreciate your uh, working with us on that. So all right, let's do it. First car regrets, 1963 Avanti R2. Dave, this is the one we throw to you first. Yeah, I've owned more than one Avanti. Um, so um, it's a, a car that I bought when I was in high school. I bought an R2 four-speed Avanti, which is kind of the top of the peak of the Avanti, uh, Avanti dom until you get to the uh, R3s. Um, a car that I decided to sell because I wanted to buy something else, I probably should have kept this one. It was a low miles, one owner car. Uh, local car to where I was, and I knew the history of the car. Um, but when winter time came and I found myself not using it, it was probably time to, to pass it on. I didn't have a garage space or anything like that. Um, it's a, uh, a car that is instantly replaceable, but they have gone up in value a little bit. Most recently, uh, they've gone up in value a lot. And, um, you know, you always want to have the first thing of whatever you had. I'd actually had a couple cars before this, but they were mostly working up to owning the, my first Studebaker Avani. How many of these have you had? Um, not for a publication. Uh, let's, just, <laughs> let's just say well over 100. Yeah. <laughs> that's, like, that's like when you get pulled over when, you, when you've been drinking and, you know, the cop says, how many beers have you had? You say two because you also had three and you also had four and you also had five, but you had two. So uh, that's, that's where that answer is. <laughs> Market's gone up. The reason it's market's gone up is because of you. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right because I keep buying them. Uh, there's that old joke about the uh, stock market guy who you know keeps buying stock and it keeps going up, and then he calls his broker and he says it's time to sell, and the broker says to who? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much the story. <laughs> well, we're hitting numbers. What do we think? Next slide, Brian. What do you got? All right, so Dave, I did a little bit of a homework here, and I think you bought this car in 1971 for $2,200. That's correct. You sold it in 1972 for $2,600. So correct. a year later, you made 400 bucks, pretty tidy profit, right? All right. <laughs> and then, of course, you rolled it into another Avanti, which was your first step into a lifelong quest to own every single one that ever was manufactured. 46 years later, had you held that car, you could have sold it for $55,000 today. So I think that's a pretty long hold time to, to make that money. I think you probably did OK. Yeah, with, with the Dave Kinney bump, it probably wouldn't be worth 52 or 51. But yeah, you're right, so. <laughs> we didn't factor that one in. <laughs> All right, let's go next. First car again, 66 Corvette Coupe. Wayne, this one's yours. Well, sort of not my first car. My first car was a 50 Chevy uh, that I bought from a neighbor for 20 bucks. But the, I got this car because I, uh, my father was restoring this woman's uh, Morgan, and she had a, a maroon Corvette, actually, pretty much like this car, uh, without side pipes, 327, 300 horse, and I had an MGB. Um, and she pulled in the driveway one day, uh, I was working on her Morgan, and she said, how would you like to trade 
my Corvette for your MGB even. I'm, I'm a junior in high school. I mean, you know. I don't think there was too much thought involved. I asked my dad, and he says, your car, you do what you want, but just remember, no one will insure you. <laughs> I didn't listen. So I, I did the trade. Uh, of course, no one would insure me. Uh, my father would let me drive with his dealer plate once a month. And then when it came time to um, go to college, my father said, you know, I'm not paying for your college. You have a Corvette. And so I had to sell the Corvette, pay for college, and uh, I never regretted that, but uh, I regretted selling the car, that's for sure. It was, it was a Marlboro Maroon car, um, 327, 300 horse, had the same hubcaps, had Michelin, uh, narrow white walls. It was, it was just a fabulous car. But the problem was I had that car and I couldn't get a date. But I bought a 59 Volkswagen the same time I owned it, and all of a sudden girls were calling me. <laughs> I, I can't explain it. They were looking for someone thrifty. <laughs> <laughs> that could have been. I think it was the parents going, you're not getting in that car with that man. <laughs> All right. What have values done on these things, Brian? All right. So 1968, Wayne traded his MGB, which was a, maybe a two-year-old car at the time, so probably worth around $2,000, best I could tell. Uh, sold in 1970 for four grand. So in two years, doubled your money. Yep. Pretty, pretty good. Plus, you got to drive a cool Corvette for a couple years. And the guy once paid, a month. The guy paid me in twenty dollar bills. It was the greatest thing in the world. I laid them all out on my bed in my room. I thought it was the richest person in the world. <laughs> uh, and, and you you rolled that into college tuition. You can't put a price on education, right? So I think all in all, you come out ahead on this one. Had you kept it, fifty years later, sixty four thousand dollars. Would have been a pretty good investment. Not bad. <laughs> but it, uh, college taught me to, to uh, get into the car business, and look what happened. There you go. Right. There must be something with 66 Corvettes. My father had one as a new, a new Corvette in 66, and uh, mysteriously, after I was born, uh, it vanished. And I believe he may still blame me for that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next slide. OK, this one's for Jeff. And, uh, this is kind of a tough one for you because I believe that's a picture of you standing next to it fairly recently. That is fairly recent. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. 55 MGTF 1500. Yes. So this car has a great story. I grew up um, in Romeo, actually not far from here. And actually the red car next to it um, was my dad's car that I helped restore when I was 10. And when I was 12, my dad asked me what I wanted for Christmas. And being a kid thinking, um, well, I said, Dad, I helped you restore your car. Maybe uh, you could get me a TF of my own, thinking I would never get anything. So I got this car here for Christmas when I was 12. The catch was that it was in pieces in the back of a pickup truck. So I had to restore that car also. But you know, I had four years. I was in school. I had summers off. So I restored that car. Um, and like I said, I grew up in Romeo. There was one lady that ran the, the Secretary of State that gave out license plates, did driver's training tests. And she had seen my dad's car running around town, and she always wanted a ride. And my dad always said, well, when my son finishes his car, he'll come down and give you a ride. So I drove down there. Well, my dad drove me down there, of course, because I didn't have my license. And then she got in, and we drove to her neighbor's house, which was a mile and a half away from the office, so her neighbor could see the car, gave me my driver's license. And uh, I mean, this is one car, although I still have the car, and it's still in the museum. So. Um, you know, that, that car I still have. But um, I mean, I'm lucky because most people's first car was really kind of a beater, right? So you got a hand me down or a beater, and so it's long, long gone. But my first car was, of course, something super special. Have you done any fun adventures in that car recently? Uh, that many. Well, I took it to, you know, well, this typical British, like a month ago, a nice day, I was going to go to lunch. I thought, well, I'll just get in and drive it to lunch. Of course, the battery was dead, right? <laughs> so a couple weeks later, we charged up the battery. I took it to lunch. Yeah, so I still drive it a couple times a year, driving home and everything. Um, but as a kid, I drove it you know, cross country. I drove one time from Detroit to Boston to the MG meet in Washington State, and then back to Romeo. I think that was about 5,000 miles in about three weeks. Uh, <laughs> of course, you, you know, before cell phones, but you traveled with a toolkit. It was great. Yeah, and a big hammer. Big hammer, absolutely. Put the fuel pump. Put the fuel pump. British standard big hammer, actually. <laughs> and I love it. All the cars in the museum 
are basically ready to drive at any time. So you guys put on tours and rallies all the time, and you just pick cars to drive, and it doesn't take a lot to get them ready for the road. Maybe a flat battery every now and then, but right. by and large, everything is ready to go. It's pretty neat. All right, Brian. All right, so leave it to Jeff to break the mold here, because he, <laughs> he never sold the car, so we can't quite do it. But 1972, you got an MGTF in a box, basically. Uh, so best, best for, guess. For free. For free, right? So best guess, maybe that cost a couple hundred bucks. Um, you never sold it. Today, that thing would be worth $40,000. Uh, but being it's your first car, to you, it's probably priceless. So I think you, you came out ahead on that one, too. We have a win. Absolutely. That <laughs> spike. Yes, I missed it. really spiked. Yeah, you missed, yeah. you missed your opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looks yeah. like a canal, so you could go underwater with it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're moving on. And this one, uh, all right, here's another one for, for Jeff. <laughs> the 86 Dodge Omni GLH Turbo. I think we all remember what... GLH meant back when that car came out. So, what do you think? So that's the GLH was probably uh, it's probably the first car I ever bought for myself. I, I lived in I lived in Romeo, went down to the Dodge dealer, and I actually had to order it. Um, came in three or four months later. Um, I always kind of like cars that are kind of mundane looking but pretty fast. I mean, because you were young and the police were always looking for you, right? So it's better not look fast. It's better just to go fast. Uh, but that's a car that I only owned three or four years. Um, I was then going to move to Nashville, and I had three or four cars. And of course, you know, do I want to take them all? Well, the GLH, that's a lot of fun, but I've had it for a few years. So, so I sold it. And, and that's a car I regret selling, because I really, I really did enjoy it. Um, it was a lot of fun, but you can't keep everything. So. Yeah, Shelby had a version of this, right? So that was the one that was the real pocket rocket right, of the right. era, right? Yes, yes. It yep. goes like hell. That was the one they primarily said for that. Yes. Goes like hell was the, was the terminology. And we have a lot of different pictures of some different ones there. So I remember in this era, a lot of cars looked like this. You know, you had Chevettes running around, um, Chevy Citations. It sort of seemed like everything had this sort of a boxy it was hatchback kind of the, the to it. The Econo box era. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Renault Alliance. I'm sorry, Alliance. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brian, what do you think? So, Jeff, the good news is, okay, so you, you bought this car in 1986. They list it new, so they list it around $8,000. Sold it 1989, if, if I have the numbers right, for 4500 bucks. So you lost $3,500 in the three years. It's pretty typical depreciation for a new car, so no surprises there. But here's the good news. Today, it's worth exactly what you paid for it in 1986, $8,200. So, so I don't have to feel bad about so, getting rid of it. Yeah, if you regret, it's very much attainable right now. You could go out and get one. Again, the trick will be finding one. They're, they're less rare than a 164E, because not as many people crush them. But um, yeah, that's the trick. They're heavily abused, though. I've looked a little bit. Have you? <laughs> yes. Well, a lot of cars from this era, I mean, they even if people took care of them, they've rusted away, just mechanical attrition, they just fall, I mean, again, like a Chevy Citation. When's the last time you saw a really, a good one? We did a, a fun thing where we tried to, what we did, we flew to Nashville, I think, and we did this, find a car for $5,000, and uh, we were gonna take it up to the, um, the Auctions America sale, and we were having, we thought we'd find interesting cars like this that were kinda, kinda kitschy, and it was really tough to find really nice condition cars of like, you know, these economy cars from the 80s. We thought we'd just find them everywhere to be like this little gem, but it didn't work out that way at all. What, what'd you finally find? What did, oh, you know what, I, uh, Matt, our social media dude over there, uh, was involved in this thing too. Brad, and, you're deflecting. <laughs> it, was, it was fun. Well, I, hey, I did better. So, um, he had a one of the Chrysler TCs by Maserati. That's Ooh. what he found, and um, took that to auction. Um, if did, I remember, that, that seemed like a good pick, right? Because he figured he'd be the only one there, and then there ended up being like three other at least TCs there. <laughs> at least know. three. Yes. Yeah, so. Stefan and Stefan picked a 450 SL Mercedes, which somehow it was practically the the halo car of the auction. There were so many of them that were in it, and he lost his shirt too. I went old school. I went 65 Corvair convertible. And uh, you know, our bogey was five grand. I think I paid $4,200 for it and sold it for $4,700. <laughs> <laughs>
which was enough to win the day uh, because we, uh, the big joke, we're watching Matt's car go, and he's just, I think he lost $2,200 or something. <laughs> which is pretty cool because it's a $2,300 car, right, Matt? <laughs> right. <laughs> And, what, and Stefan, the Mercedes, it's on the rotisserie. This is all on the web. We hit, this is all on Haggerty's YouTube channel. You can go back and watch all this nonsense that we do over the years. But as it's on the rotisserie, the, the rocker trim falls off and lands on the ground. And we're all just like, oh my god. So the bidding was not tremendously strong on that car either. I feel that we've digressed, but that's fine. All right, moving on. More instant remorse. Dave, this is kind of a big deal here. That's yeah. a fairly recognizable car. Yeah, I was in high school, and um, I, you know, I remember. Yeah, you know, sometimes you remember all the details of something, and I remember all the details. I bought it from Frank Luark at Auto Buying Service in Fairfax County, Virginia. I was in Arlington, Virginia, and I paid thirteen hundred and fifty dollars. Now, at the time, I was working at a car place. I all proud, you know, shined it up and all that. GT three fifty H brought it back. My boss who was a car guy, told me I got totally ripped off and it was a $900 car. And so like all the, you know, all the inflation, you know, all the fun stuff goes instantly out of it. And I'm like, you know what, I'm just gonna enjoy it. I'm gonna have fun. I'm in high school, so you know, it's a great car for high school. Parked it in the parking lot, left it outside, all that sort of stuff. Um, one thing interesting, the best part of the story was that when I opened the trunk, there was a spare, remember those, those, those uh, tacks on the dash or those soup can uh, uh, tacks? There was a spare tack that was in the back. And it was like, uh, you know, there's that panel in the back of Mustangs um, uh, underneath the, um, uh, right alongside the trunk to elongate the trunk, a little piece of, uh, you know, cardboard stuff. And, and there was a tack that somebody had left back there. And so I kept the tack. And if you, I, I'm no mechanic, but I did have a mechanic's toolbox. And if, you, if you're like most people, the really heavy stuff goes on the bottom to keep your toolbox from falling over on you. So you put the really heavy stuff. But the second drawer from the bottom is where you put your treasures. And so I had this, and I kept it. And when I sold the car for, I believe, $1,650, because I'm a big baller and I was you know, making lots of money there, um, I kept the tack. Um, interestingly, a friend of mine was over, you know, we were going through stuff. I pulled my, the, the drawer out and he goes, hey, that's a, that's a tack from a 66 Shelby. I said, yeah. And he said, you know, I know somebody who needs one for their 66 Shelby. Is it for sale? And I said, yeah, maybe, I don't know. And he said, what do you want for it? And I said, $1,350. <laughs> now this was like 20 years later, you know, this was like in the 90s, early 90s or maybe late 80s or something like that. And uh, so he calls me later that afternoon and says, does it work? And I said, I have no way of testing it. Let's just say it doesn't work, but I still want $1,350. And like two days later, he drove over with $1,350 in cash. So I doubled my money on the car. So uh, you know, this will help me feel a little better when Brian comes up with the numbers here. So. <laughs> Did you factor that in, Brian? I didn't. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to adjust the numbers with that tachometer story. Yeah, don't look to your right, Dave. That's yeah. <laughs> it, it gets worse. This is the best one for me. All right, so 1971, you bought the car, Shelby Rent a Racer for 1350. You owned it for a year, you sold it for 1650, and then again 1350 for the tack later. In that one year you owned it, three hundred dollar profit. Uh, so not bad, right? Just a high school kid driving a cool car, turning it for a couple hundred bucks. Um, I noticed that this is the same year you sold your Avanti, 1972. So I think the lesson might be... I'm an idiot. Keep the Shelby. <laughs> when you have a Shelby and you have a Studebaker in the garage, sell the Studebaker. The, uh, the Hertz car is now $184,000. Yeah, and you know, it's funny because people are always asking me, you know, what's the serial number of the car? Because they want the history. I don't know what the serial number was. What difference did it make in 1972? Uh, it was a used car that I bought at a used car lot. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to say I don't have any paperwork, but I do have a photo that I took. A buddy of mine was riding along with me, and he took a photo of me in a car, and I've got like the pea jacket, the long hair, yeah, I had hair, um, the long hair, the whole thing. 
And then I realized it's a picture of me in any generic 66 Mustang because there's no stripes, there's no Shelby, there's no anything, because inside it's just another Mustang. So the only photo I have you know, doesn't even show the uh, Shelby part. But was, was it an automatic? It was an automatic, oh, yeah. I, yeah. Now I feel better. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> very, very rare to get the four the four speed. speed it would have been a lot. Yeah. Exactly, and I think that was my boss's point that you know maybe the the four speed might have been worth thirteen fifty, but not for an automatic. So, uh, but it was a good, reliable car. I never really had any problems with it. So, you know, high school kid make three hundred bucks. That was, yeah, you know, better than working <laughs> at McDonald's. So, well, I've I've seen some strategies on avoiding capital gains, but I think <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> a lot of foresight there. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> All right. Instant remorse, 59 Alpha Spider Veloce, Wayne, and this is a special car. Yeah, this is, a, so it's my daughter Kimberly, this is Kimberly's car actually, we've uh, designated that as Kimmy's car. Um, I was at Amelia Island, uh, it was probably 10 years ago, and I was trying to buy a DKW, and um, as I was bidding on it at the RM sale, I noticed who I was bidding against and I knew it was all over, that I would never end up with the DKW no matter how much I bid. Because Mr. Bear had a heavier hand than I did, and he held it up. So I, I was sort of uh, down in the dumps a little bit, and I walked into the lobby of the hotel, and I saw a friend of mine, and, and he says, you, you look a little down. I said, oh, I just missed this DKW. I got money burning a hole in my pocket. And he says, do you want to buy a 59 Alpha Julietta Spider? And I said, yes. So showed, showed me a picture. I bought it on the spot, took it back to my shop. Uh, we had a Cars and Coffee one Saturday, and one of my clients comes in, and he said, I'd love to buy that car. I said, ah, it's not for sale. What's the not for sale price? <laughs> so I shot him some crazy number. Um, he purchased it, drove away that day in the car. And uh, about two years later, he calls me. He says, you know, I've decided to sell the Alpha. Would you like to buy it back? I said, sure, I'd love to. I'm prepared to pay him what he paid me for the car. He says, listen, the Ferrari dealer I'm going to trade it in at will give me X, which was a lot less than what he paid me for the car. So I said, I'll take him for that. So I was prepared to pay the higher price. I got it for the lower price. And now um, it's going to stay in the family. I regretted the sale. Um, Kimmy uh, really liked uh, riding in the car, and now it's our go-to car on summer afternoons uh, to take a ride. So, uh, beautiful little car. It's a Veloce, besides, uh, with a beautiful uh, gray color. It was a one-owner car um, with uh, just one paint job on it, and that was it, and still is today. So, pretty cool car. Now, yeah. How so did I do? I think you did great, right? Yeah, I think you got I did it back. very good. So 2008, you bought it for $35,000. 2009, you sold it for 50, I think. Yep. That, yep. So $15,000 in a year, that's a pretty good turn. Right. But this is one of those cars where it's, it's all about the experience that you get to enjoy with this car, right? It's, right. It has nothing to do with money. So you just throw it all out and, and uh, you have it back and you got a chance to, to recap or erase that remorse and now you get to enjoy it with your daughter. Right. But that 90000 is looking pretty tempting. It does look, <laughs> it does look pretty good. Yeah, forget that whole family yeah. story. <laughs> 90 Gs, it's gone. <laughs> Kimmy, how do you like green money? <laughs> and spending time with your daughter in cars over the years has been one of your great loves, hasn't that's it? That's right, that's right. And so when she... Uh, Kim will let me know. Kimmy's pretty nonverbal, but she lets me know when she really likes something. But she really lets me know when she doesn't like riding in something. So um, the, the Alpha is one of her favorite cars. The Rain Man Buick, too, she loves riding in that. So it's, it's really cool to be able to, to spend time with my daughter and uh, enjoy driving a car. And it's inspired you to do a lot of work with autism research yes. um, in a very meaningful way, yeah. also. Absolutely. Let's come back next year and see what it's worth. Right. <laughs> All right, our next segment here is uh, bad timing, which uh, I think is going to be pretty hilarious. <laughs> so, 75 Maserati Bora, Jeff. Maserati Bora. So, <clears throat> it's a car that I always wanted. Uh, you know, it has the looks, and it was supposedly fast, and I hunted for one for probably five years. Actually, one of the stories is uh, I found one in um, Seattle, Washington. 
I think I saw it in Hemmings. And so I was going to fly. I flew. I did. I flew out to look at it. The guy promised me it was perfect. It was running great. It was a nice car and everything. I was looking for maybe, I wasn't looking for a concourse car because I like to drive my car. So, but it, it, nice and running. I get out there and it's in his garage. It's in the back. He's got to charge the battery. He's got to put the license plate on it. I'm like, when's the last time you drove it? Oh, like three or four months ago. It'll fire right up. So he fiddles around with it for like three or four hours to get it running. And then we go out with it, it's missing. It, it runs like garbage, you know, and it's like, oh, the brakes are a little weak. He's driving. I'm scared to death. I'm afraid he's going to kill us. So he brings me back to his house, and I'm like, oh, I'm not interested in that. But I finally, I finally did find one um, from a, a guy in Ohio. Uh, but after I bought it and drove it a little bit, I found out, well, it's, 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 it's like an MG, that made an MG be reliable. I mean, every time you wanted to drive it, you knew it wasn't going to start or something was going to break before you get out of the garage, right? So the first thing is you've got to work on it. And then when you drive it, I mean, it sounded great, but it shifted like a truck. And it was kind of, it was heavy and it handled like a truck because I'm kind of, I mean, everybody's different about cars, but since I grew up with a TF, which doesn't have a lot of power, but it is light and agile, I mean, this car is like three times the weight. Um, so, so, you know, and the worst thing was it's, it's, it's like a, a theater in there with all the glass. And, of course, usually what happens is you take off and you want to roll down the window because you're burning up and the window won't roll down. You know, it's electric, okay, so you're stuck. Um, and then one time I went to, of course, you always check the oil before you go anywhere because it might have, you know, you drove it 50 miles last time. It might have burned all the oil or it might have leaked all out or it might have been a combination. So there's two levers on the sill where you can open the, the driver's door and I go to flick one of those and it breaks off. You know, it's about this long, it's just cheap cast. So it's only $325 for one of those. So after that happened, it was like, it's gone, it's out of here. Maseratis didn't always have this reputation for unreliability. I mean, some of the earlier cars were just absolutely epic, right? I mean, right, but this had the Citron hydraulics. Right. Yeah, exactly. uh, I mean, it was on and on. You know, if it, if it wasn't the hydraulics, it was the motor or it was something else. It was, it was our dash lights would go out at night as you're driving along. And it's, now you can't see anything, right? So, Just, just like all the Citroëns, uh, everything operates on, under the hydraulics. Right. You right. Know, the seats go back and forth hydraulic. Right. So. right, yes, absolutely. You don't have enough oil in it, the seats won't move. It looked great sitting in the garage, but that was it. What was, how big was the motor in this one? So they had a couple that were, like you had the... Four, seven. You had the Indies, the Maracs, the Boras. There were, two, there were two size motors, I think four, seven, and five, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And this had the small, and it also had the ugly American bumpers, because I like the earlier cars before, I think, 73 or two, had the nice small chrome bumpers. This car was a 75, so it had the big black. So it was a beautiful car with these ugly black bumpers on the front and back. It was just like, it was hideous. Are there any documented stories of people driving one of these and enjoying it? <laughs> no, I, you know, I've never talked to yeah. any Bora owner. You know, most Bora owners that I got to know, that they liked working on their cars and polishing them. But driving was never part of the equation. <laughs> I actually, I, I enjoy, I, I, I worked, at a, I worked yeah. at a place that had a couple of Boras and I did enjoy them. I, I like the, the Ghibli, the, the car that preceded it a lot more. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they were, you know, uselessly, unnecessarily complicated. And that was kind of the era. So I, I totally get that because everything had to be power assisted or vacuum operated or whatever. Uh, but damn, they look good. And um, a friend of mine, um, also, uh, about my age, worked at a dealership, and he was showing it to somebody and then decided to take it out for a quick spin before locking down the back. And uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a clamshell back, so it goes up like this. So a giant air brake. Um, <laughs> and when he was doing 65 miles an hour, it came loose and tore the bodywork off the back of the, of the Bora. So uh, now I think there's a Bora pickup truck somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting you say that it drives like a truck. A lot of the Italian cars that I've driven, like they seem to have this same heaviness to, you know, you're in a, an MG, you kind of flick your way through the gearbox. It's, instead of saying truck, you say it has an agricultural gearbox. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I drove one, I bought one, and the guy had spent $65,000 doing the mechanics on it right before I bought it. So it really went real, real well, but I decided to sell it real quick before everything went bad again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like the car. I think it's a great car. I think they're awfully pretty. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we'll do a seminar on people that have had successful experiences with historically unreliable vehicles. That could be kind of fun, you know? 
getting a lot of takers on that one, obviously. All right, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So Money. Turns out a lot of people agree with Wayne here. Uh, people love his car. At least enough people to make it worth $140,000, right? Yeah. So, Jeff, you bought this car in 2000 for $40,000. You sold it in 2008 for $40,000. So, I think you came out ahead because in the subsequent 10 years, you probably avoided hundreds of thousands of dollars in maintenance. <laughs> yes. So, you're looking good and right now. And very little driving. So, right, exactly, and uh, you could have sold it for $140,000, but when you add the 40 to what you would have spent to keep it on the road, um, you're probably coming out ahead, I'm gonna guess. Yes. You've got another one that's sort of like this in the museum. How, I'm wondering how you feel about the, your Yuraco. How's that one coming along? You know, that, that's, uh, I mean, I like driving that car, and, and, and it's really shot up in value, so we've kept it, but um, that's another car that every time you wanna drive it, you know, it goes into the shop, and the mechanic's got to work on it for half a day before you can go anywhere. And, you know, I got in it one, one day to drive it, and I lean back, and the seat goes all the way back. Like, the thing that holds the seat back on is apparently broken, so it's like all, and it's got a heavy clutch, so you can't really, like, drive it without, you know, a back seat. But, but it, it's a nice car. So a good new seminar would be, in the museum, we have this thing about the worst driving car in the museum. It's kind of a contest that we have between all of us, and it's, it travels between cars. That would be a good, good topic. That's for fun. People. Yeah. I remember the, the Uraco was having an engine rebuild several years ago, and you walk into this area where they're rebuilding all these cars, and they're just engine parts just scattered to the winds in there, and you're like, God, how many engines are you guys doing? Just that one. <laughs> it's just a lot of aluminum. <laughs> I, uh, I actually sold a new Uraco back in the day. It was a 75, I think, Uraco, and it was a leftover. And a beautiful car, black with tan, and we got it in a trade, the, the place that I worked at. And um, we put it up for sale for $10,000, which was a little bit less than the list price was probably 13000 or 16000 or something like that. And we had absolutely no one take a look at it. We just had absolutely no one come in. No one was interested in it. And I really liked the car. We got a call one day from a guy in Los Angeles. And um, he said that he'd like to buy the car. And we agreed at $10,000. And everything was fine. I think he wired the money or he brought a certified check, whatever. Um, he shows up. And I pick him up at the airport. And he's wearing doctor's scrubs. And he's got like a three-day growth of a beard. And he was a brand new doctor, and his plan was to drive the car across country. Um, keep in mind, this was in Arlington, Virginia, and was going to Los Angeles. And um, so, in a very nice way, I said, you know, please give me a call when you make it to L.A. Um, <laughs> if you make it to L.A. Are you still waiting for that call? <laughs> no. Um, the really funny thing is, uh, like, four days later, I got a phone call. And, uh, you know, it was, it was literally the middle of the night, and I happened to be there really, really late. And uh, he said, yeah, I just got off my shift. He said, I drove it. He said, I changed the oil in, like, Kansas City or something like that. He said, no problems at all. I absolutely love this car. I can't thank you enough. So there you go. And wow. now it's worth a little more. So, uh, you know, I don't know if he still has it. But um, that was my one experience selling a brand-new car. So. <laughs> all right. Bad timing here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What do we um, think? Yeah, <laughs> yeah this to, is real bad timing. Point, I, but... <laughs> I, need to, I need to set this up a little bit. Um, I bought the uh, ESO uh, for $3,500, $3,350, $3,500. I was in Fort Lauderdale. A friend of mine's a dealer down there. I said, you know, what do you have that you just haven't bought because you don't have time for it? And he said, well, there's this wrecked ESO. It's drivable. It's wrecked in the right rear end. Um, and, you know, the guy wants 5000 bucks, and that seemed pretty good. So, like I said, I went out. I think we agreed on $3,350, $3,500. Now, at the time, I had a roommate, um, you know, literally my best friend from high school, and we had a garage, and I said, you know, we can put this car back together ourselves. You know, we don't, we don't need any help. And so that meant to him and to me that he's going to do all the work, and I'm going to pay for the uh, body work. <laughs> And uh, so we did. We put the car back together. I called Steve Barney, who was then still Foreign Cars Italia in Rome. Now there's a place called Foreign, Foreign Cars Italia in North Carolina, and that was Steve Barney's business as well. And, and so, but I knew him back from his days in Italy, and I said, these are the parts I need you to order for my ESO. And we needed a new bumper, and we needed a new tail light, we needed some chrome pieces, and that was about it. My buddy Walt um, decided to take a 
high school extension course in doing body repair. So two days a week, he'd put this thing on a trailer and he'd take it to the high school where he'd do body work on the car. Now you'd think this was going to end up horribly. Uh, Walt was a real, he still is, he's a real craftsman and he learned how to do body work uh, the very first time on an ESO Grifo. And the car turned out beautifully. I mean, you know, he had people helping him with all the stuff and everything else. And the car turned out very, very nicely. Um, during the course of the body work, the windshield cracked. Um, and so the windshield was another expense that we had to do. But once again, I'm a really smart investor. And um, it was in Auto Week, as a matter of fact. John Mat uh, Metris wrote a story on it. And so I decided to put it for sale. When I put it for sale, about a year later, I put it in uh, Auto Week. And uh, we sold the car for $10,000. And I sold it to an FBI agent. So I'm sure I'm on a list somewhere. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, it was a, uh, a four-speed car, 327. Uh, beautiful, beautiful car, early one, like a 64, 65. Um, and one of the prettiest cars I've ever, I've ever really owned in terms of just plain looking at it. And they're fantastic to drive. Uh, a friend of mine once described it as a, a Corvette in, a, in an Italian suit. Um, and, you know, we did have good luck with it, but uh, no regrets selling it at 10. So make me feel my regrets now, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, again, Dave, avert your eyes as we uh, look at the, the graph here. So 1977, you bought this car for 3,500 bucks, put in a little bit of money on fixing it up, uh, bumper, taillight, et cetera. Sold in 1979 for $10,000, so $6,500 profit over two years. In, in today's money, that's $22,000. So that, I mean. That makes me feel a be, little bit better. <laughs> you should be commended for that. That's very entrepreneurial. You were probably feeling pretty flush after that. Oh, yeah. However, today, that car would sell for $400,000. Mm -hmm. See, see so, so the Shelby wasn't the worst one, OK? <laughs> and I. I don't know. We'll see what Wayne has in store, but you might, you're in the running for grand champion of this thank you. Uh, contest. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and it's, one, in, it's important just to be nominated, but thank you very much. <laughs> one comment. So you're talking about uh, the unreliabil unreliability of a lot of Italian cars. This, this car solved that, right? You just put a Corvette it's a, engine in it's it. It's a Corvette motor, and you know, this was way before the era of computers and electronics, so everything kind of, well, Italian electrics, but um, everything kind of made sense. Just you had to carry a spare fuse or two around with you and, you know, a couple of wires to jump over the fuse in case you really <laughs> needed to go somewhere. But um, no, it was, a, it was a, a, an easy to live with car, a very easy to live with car. My, my dad uh, fixed one of these when I was uh, working for him and uh, it was really a hand built car. Uh, the right door was about an eighth of an inch shorter than the left door. You can't see both so, sides at the same exactly. time. Exactly. So, you know, <laughs> there had to be one guy uh, did the right side, one guy did the left side. But uh, it, it was a very interesting car, pretty cool. So uh, I wish I still had that car. But yeah. And would, I wish I had the 400 grand, too. But. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I've always loved these because these are, this is my kind of hybrid. When you have a, a European body with an American powertrain, you get all the beauty and interesting styling, and then the dead nuts reliability of a car you can go to Napa and repair. I've got a, a Sunbeam Tiger that I'm restoring right now, and it's exactly that. It's a really interesting British car with all the weird, well, it does have some Lucas stuff in it, but it runs pretty good. I have a lot of fun with it. Yeah, that was back when the hybrid meant something completely different than what it means now. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so you, you don't want to go around saying, yeah, I have a hybrid, because everybody figures you have a Toyota Prius. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and ESOs, you could get a big block in some of those oh, yeah. also, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, the there were some really uh, hairy cars. And then they were Ford powered later on. Yeah, they were, uh, they, um, after they, they left the United States market, they were no longer legal here. They sold a lot in Germany. And some of them said, had big block Fords as well. Yeah. But they had to put a, like a, basically a, another story on the hood and it just didn't look really well. It had this huge hood bulge that was all square. Not really well done, but hey, no regrets. I'd have one still. Yeah, what do they call it? A chicken coop or something yeah. when they have it on the, on the hood like yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, it's every yeah. bit of that. Yeah, the small block is, is a way prettier looking car. Oh boy, <laughs> here's Wayne's next one for bad timing. 246 GTS Dino. Arguably one of the prettiest well, designs ever. It was good timing at the time. It was good timing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a, a good friend of mine, uh, maybe some of you uh, know him from our TV show, Herb Chambers, who owns now 63 car dealerships, something like that. 
Herb owned a company called Acopy, and he bought one of these. He took it in trade, actually, on a Daytona that he had. And one day, he pulls in the shop, and he gets out of the car. He says, did you know this is a six-cylinder car? <laughs> I said, yeah. He says, I didn't know that. I only drive 12-cylinder Ferraris. I can't have this car. He says, do you want to buy it? Now, I didn't have enough money to put gas in the car to go home that afternoon. So I said, Herb, I can't afford it. He says, could you pay me in a year? I said, I suppose so. How much do you want? He says, $12,000. So I said, well, I suppose I could. He says, drive me back to the office. It's yours. So now I've got a beautiful little blue Dino. I'm just dating my wife at the time. And um, all the kids in the neighborhood thought it was pretty cool that Lori was going out with some guy with a Ferrari. So I win points there. We had a lot of fun with the car. But after getting married, uh, certain other things started to happen, so I sold the car. Um, now we're going to hear the uh, rest of the story. <laughs> All right, so 1978, you bought it for $12,000. Sold it in 1979 for 15, I think. So a year, yeah. you made $3,000 again. Pretty, I mean, like, you got to drive that Ferrari and you made money. So I'm, what, I'm, what I'm glad I learned over the years. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm educated. Um, the funny thing about this car is you, it had two run-ups since you sold it, right? So yeah. in the 80s, it went up dramatically. So if you had waited five years, you probably could have sold it for, I don't know, $55,000. If you had waited 25 years, you would have had the, the second run-up. Um, and today, that car is worth $320,000. Now, I've sold a couple of, uh, I've sold one for $450,000 right, so, uh, a few years ago. Yeah. But, I liked the car so much that I restored one to be just like it for a client of mine. And unfortunately, he passed away. And I ended up buying it from his estate. Um, and I just recently sold it again. So uh, I, I think I did OK in the long run. I, I would yeah, agree with that. I think yeah. I did OK in the long run. And I think the, the lesson here that I'm picking up on is don't ever sell any cars, probably. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be smart if you, if, if you had enough money to afford to park them all. So, so I think Dave's still the winner. Thank goodness. <laughs> you gave him a run, though, Wayne. I gave him a run. But yeah. uh, we like D Dave winning things like this. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> the, the blue of the Dino. Blue Sarah? Blue Sarah. So that turned into a color that you really like, I hear. We've painted uh, probably six uh, blue Sarah cars. Jonathan and I were actually at a, at a client's in St. Louis a couple of uh, weeks ago, and we saw his blue Sarah that I'd restore for him. It's just a, a wonderful color. Um, we've done blacks and reds and, and that, but uh, the blue Sarah with the tobacco interior really works. Really works well. What's a Dino and like? It's just such a nice car to drive. I mean, yeah. Dinos are just wonderful cars to drive. Um, I sit in the car because I'm so short, and I look up over the fenders, and the fenders got these great humps in it. And, and it feels like you're driving a race car. Um, it's not very powerful, but it's powerful enough to have a lot of fun with. You roll the uh, right window down, and you can hear the air being sucked into the carburetors. Um, it's got a unique sound and, and a, a unique driving position. And it's just one of the most wonderful cars to drive, I think, and one of the most beautiful cars ever built. Yeah, I, I think agree that with was that. one of the things that really caused them to go up in value as people started realizing they were a lot of fun to drive on rallies. Well, they, you know, their name them. Dino, they weren't really known as a Ferrari because there wasn't a Ferrari name on it. There wasn't actually a prancing horse on it. It was named after uh, Ferrari's son Dino. Fiat actually built the cars. So there was a little controversy, and, and guys that owned Ferraris, like Herb, didn't want anything but a 12 cylinder. Um, they really lost out, I think, because I think it's one of the most beautiful cars ever built. I saw uh, something on a Ferrari chat post. There are people that have put V8s in these also, haven't they? Kind of, yeah. And they're really just can make some screaming hot rods out of these things. They do. There's, there's a few outlaws out there. Yeah. yeah the uh, driving experience in a Dino for me is a little different. Uh, I look out <laughs> over the windshield, <laughs> which means I can only uh, get into the GTS version, which is the, the, you know, the target top one. And I drove one uh, from Fort Lauderdale, Florida to uh, Orlando, Florida, and I remember it was scary as hell because I'd have to duck down, uh, you know, most of the time to avoid getting bugs on my forehead. Um, <laughs> so it just it didn't work for me because you know I'm that much taller. But uh, um, I can understand why those cars have such appeal. Um, it did 
it tracked beautifully. I mean, it was a car that you just point and shoot and went wherever you wanted to go, but not for me. Yeah. Well, we have a special treat um, as part of the seminar today. Um, we have a gentleman named Jim Kennedy who's here in the audience, and we did a little poll uh, beforehand, uh, kind of an of a audio of our members to see who may have a really neat story they'd like to come and just share with everybody. So Jim's got a microphone, and we're going to be talking about his 62 421 Super Duty uh, that was a pretty special car. So Jim, if you'd stand up and make sure we can hear you, but um, thank you very much for coming and sharing your story today. Well, um, back in uh, the spring of uh, 68, I was in college, and a friend of mine called me up and said that the car of my dreams was for sale in Royal Oak, and it was this car. And uh, I called the guy up, and it was a, a week before finals. I called the guy up and said, uh, I'd really like to buy your car. Is it still available? He said, yes. He said, well, I'll be home tomorrow for the weekend, uh, I'd like to take a look at it, and uh, if you could save it for me, I'd like to buy it. So I came down, we looked at it, uh, a friend of mine that told me about it, uh, and it was everything that he said it was, it was in great shape. Uh, it was one of the first three that uh, <clears throat> Pontiac Motors built in uh, November of 61 to go to the Pure Oil Performance Trials. Uh, I was number three of the three, and the other two are gone. Uh, and this is the only one left. Um, and uh, anyway, I, I said, uh, I'll be back. I have finals next week. Uh, I'll be back with the money. Uh, my dad gives me money every summer to buy a car that I'll work off painting the house or mowing the lawn, whatever. I said, uh, he's given me $800, and the guy wanted 1000 So I gave him 200 and said, tell my dad, it's a thousand, you know, it's 200, it's $800. Um, so he said, fine. I came back with my parents, and I said, the other thing is, we can't open the hood and we can't start it. Because uh, it, was, it was basically a factory race car. And he said, fine, no problem. So my dad gave him the money, said, why do you want this car? It's a two-door sedan. Uh, it was the, the bottom of the line. I said, oh, I really like it. Uh, it's got eight lug wheels, and because Royal had done all that stuff to it. But uh, uh, he said, okay. So my parents left. We stayed uh, with the the guy that I bought the car from, uh, and uh, hung out with him for a while. Talked about the car a little more. Drove it home. Uh, dropped my friend off. He lived about four houses down from me. Uh, I got the car going fast enough that I could shut it off and park it in the driveway without my parents hearing it. Um, this was on a Friday night, um, and back then you couldn't uh, get a plate or anything until Monday. They weren't open on the weekends, so I never opened the hood, I never started, I never did anything all weekend. My parents went to work, and I had to go back to school, and I was taking this back to school with me. I, my dad was... Uh, the uh, sales manager at the Pineac retail store in downtown Pineac, and I had a lot of friends that were there, that worked there, mechanics. So, I'd, well, after I got the plate and everything, I figured, well, I'll show my friends what I just got. And everybody in that dealership but my dad knew exactly what it was. <laughs> and I said, well, I gotta go, I gotta go back to school. So I left, I come back, and as soon as I get home after that week, my parents said, you have to sell this car. You, you know, this is a race car. And I said, oh. So I put a for sale sign in it with no price. Anybody asked me how much I wanted for it, I told them $10,000. The car didn't sell. So when I went back to school in the fall, uh, we stored it in my grandmother's garage because she didn't drive anymore. And uh, I just left it there all the whole season. Uh, the next spring, when I got home, uh, first thing I did was get the car and drive it home, and they said, if this car isn't sold by the end of the summer, we're not paying your tuition. So I had to sell the car. Uh, and I sold the car uh, for $1,000. For $1, uh, I think my dad probably gave the guy a better deal because I had to go back to school and the car still wasn't sold, but uh, I'll never know. 
Um, anyway, as soon as I got back from school that next year, I started looking for the car because I wanted to buy it back. And I would store it in a friend's garage or whatever, but I wanted the car. And probably spent 30 years looking for it. Uh, the guy I bought it from, he and I both were, became good friends. We used to meet up at St. Ignace every year because we'd heard that the car was up in the UP. We looked and looked for probably a good 15, 20 years up there, uh, checking junkyards and everything else, never could find it. Finally rent to a junkyard and a guy said, yeah, there was this white Pontiac that used to outrun the police and it had dual quads and all this. And we figured that was the car because it was gone, uh, they told us. Uh, so I gave up. Um, and that's pretty much the story. Uh, I've, I've still looked for it. Uh, I had, uh, whenever I went to a car show, I, I had a, a wanted sign that I put on my dash looking for the car. Uh, there it is. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. Uh, fortunately, a good friend of mine, Dwayne Strohshine, found the car, and it's his now. Uh, but <laughs> happy ending. <laughs> Which is great. Uh, so it's a happy ending. I've seen the car. It's been restored. And uh, it's pretty neat. Uh, but that's the one that got away that uh, I hate to guess what it's for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim. Yeah. Appreciate the story very much. <laughs> I think that that's a tactic a lot of us have used when we, quote unquote, have to get rid of a car and you price it for maybe one person on the moon that would be interested in, in paying that price. So, <laughs> All right, um, I think that we've gotten to the point in our story where we actually do have some values on the car, right? We have a slide? We do, for, yeah. So yeah, right I, there. Uh, that's, a, that's a great story and what a cool car and I hope that Jim lets you drive it. Um, uh, yeah, so, and this is one of those cars. It's a Super Duty Pontiac uh, factory race car. It's an important part of American motorsports history. And uh, it's really hard to put a value on a car like that because it's one of one. But we do carry that in the price guide, and it's almost a $200,000 car. Feel good? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, look at you, Dwayne. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. So what we want to do now is we want to have uh, some time for some Q&A. So we have some microphones that are being fired up, and they will come to you. And uh, we have a gentleman in the front row who's already raised his hand so nicely, so politely. Mm -hmm. Catholic school? Yeah. <laughs> so we'll come up. We're getting those fired up. And they should work just great, but just make sure you speak in them. And, uh, and Matt, if you have any... Anything on the live stream that's just really exciting, you're welcome to throw that out. So, um, right, there you go. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Fabrizio Bechia. Let's make sure we've got it working Hello? in there. Hello, okay, there we, we go. got it. Okay, my name is Fabrizio Bechia. Actually, uh, I want, Dave, uh, I watch your show all the time. And so, thank you. And uh, so you guys, but, uh, so my story here, when I came in this country, uh, I was 24 years old. Uh, was a 1978. Uh, I just came out of Italy. The X19 was a hot car for young guys like me. Man, you can get a lot of chicks with it. Um, when well, I got one. in this country, I, I came broke out of college. My dad was here, and he said to me, "I give you two advice: don't buy Italian cars and don't use credit cards." <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, I kind of, then I got married and all the other things, and so uh, one day I was walking by the Plymouth, Plymouth here, Plymouth Road, there was the Bertone North America dealer, and he had an X19, and I said, shit, I'm going to buy this car, so I bought the car, <laughs> so I bought the car for 3500 bucks, and it drove nice, 35,000 miles, how great, you know, I'm not a car nut, but I love the Italian stuff, I'm an, I'm an industrial designer, so I love the stuff. And um, my accountant, his name was Adalberto Ferrari, which nothing to do with Ferrari, but he owned the Ferrari. And he was going back in Italy, 
he owned the 308 GT4 2 plus 2 and he practically begged me to get this car and I did you know I bought money and I bought the other car so now I have the X19 and a 308 GT4 as you know both car was commissioned back in the 70s by when Fiat took over Ferrari. It was the 308 was the only car available in America, uh, homologated for the American USA market, and and both cars are the same. I mean, I call the Ferrari bastard child because a lot of people, like we were saying before, the Dino emblem was on it, and then this car actually came in the country with the Ferrari emblem. So my question, I guess, now you know I'm over the 60, uh, you know, it's one of those cars, like you were saying, that, you know, actually, I'm pretty lucky. I never spent too much money on it. Actually, I changed the clutch one time. Tough car, I mean, really nice car. Uh, drives, not, I mean, it's not an easy car to drive. It's heavy, but pretty nice. I mean, it's actually, so now the question is, is in a preservation mode. The car is 99.9%. I'm the second owner. I got both cars. Um, my wife, why don't you sell the car? <laughs> so the question is, should I fix the car first and sell it? Should I sell it as it is? Right now it's probably on a three number of a listed. Uh, or should I fix it and save it? I mean, I drive it. I mean... What do you guys say? I would, I, I would keep it myself. I mean, you know. Beautiful. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to come I, and I'm kiss you later. I'm actually fascinated with having an accountant named Ferrari who drives Ferrari. <laughs> I want my accountants to drive Priuses. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I'll tell you more. I'll tell you more. There is a, let me then say this. When I met the guy, because I collect Ferrari cars and memorabilia, and I had... And I was talking with an acquaintance, and the guy goes, "Ah, oh, like, you got to meet Alberto. You got to meet Alberto." So I said, "Okay." So we met each other, and they say, "So are you Italian?" "Yeah, I'm Italian." And he goes, "So where you come from?" And I say, "Oh, near Rome. You know, it's like a Detroit. You know, saying Livonia, you say Detroit. You know what I mean?" So I say, "Near Rome." "Oh, me too." And he goes, "So where? Oh, buy this. Uh, you know, blah blah blah." And he goes, "Me too." Uh, well, I'm right a little far, like 20 miles from. Oh, me too. I went to school there. And he goes, oh, my town is like, and he goes, oh, my girlfriend was from your town. And then, so are you married? Yeah, I got a, a, a one child. And he goes, uh, what's your name? Gianluca. My two. They both were born on the same day and the same month. You believe that? And so that's the story with Alberto <laughs> Ferrari. Uh, so, uh, you know, and so we became good friends. I mean, like I said, he went in Italy, was practically crying. Take the car, so I bought the car. So, I, so I should keep, keep it. Keep it and drive. Keep it and drive. Dave, one question. You know, the timing belt, the story, you know, every time you go out, your heart is pumping, you know, you never know. But should like, my old friends over here, the Bertoni mechanics, which they were great guys, and these guys breed engine. He said, oh, don't worry about it. You know, if ain't broken, don't fix it. Uh, back years ago. True, false, I mean. Well, I mean, timing belts, it all depends. If they break, you're going you're gonna to ruin the engine or, or bend the valves. Uh, I have a friend of mine that has 165,000 miles on his 308, and he's never changed the belt. So who knows? You're gonna, you always take that chance. But he looks at it this way. If the engine expires, look at all the money he's saved over the years. He could just throw <laughs> the car away. So. Good thing. Thank, thank you, you very Thank much, you very guys. much. Thank, thank you very thank you. much. Another question? See some hands? I think Allison's coming with that one there. Thanks for a, a great seminar this morning, guys. Um, I've run into a bunch of people in my time who own a number of cars, lovely pole buildings, you know. Living in Michigan, these things get stored all winter because you can't drive them. At what point? Do you look at your investment of buying something that's fairly abused, throw your money at it, and maybe come up with a car that's actually worth more money when, you come, when it comes time to sell it? At what point do you stop being a casual collector and turn yourself into a small business because you own five or eight cars? 
Any comments on that? Jeff, you own more, more uh, cars than me, so you know, go ahead. You know, um, I think it's whatever, whatever you're comfortable with, um, and, and, and it depends on what you like to do. I mean, there's some people that, that like to collect cars and have them to look at, maybe drive a few of them, but the other ones they don't drive. Some people are like, uh, I knew one uh, English friend that in his premarital agreement, he could only have six classic cars. <laughs> and that was it. And that was, I mean, it's like when he found a Tatra he liked, he had to sell something else. So I think it's whatever your comfort level is. And I think it depends, too, on where you live and how expensive it is to store things. I mean, if you live in the country and you can put up a pole barn, you got plenty of room, it's not expensive. I think most of us as collectors don't like to see cars just sit out and, and you know, kind of fall into the ground. So um, I don't know that there's any confirmed answer for that. I think it's your comfort level and, and your passion and, and how much time and resources you have. That's a good answer. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm a car collector that became a car dealer to, feel, to feed my passion, sort of like Ferrari uh, had to make road cars in order to feed his passion of racing. So, um, you know, it, it's all intermingled. And, and Jeff's saying that the guy has to sell a car to buy another car. We have a new rule in our house. We're supposed to sell one car to buy another car, so we're even. Um, but uh, now we sell one car and I get to buy three motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good trade-off now, you know? Um, you know, we can spend that same amount of money, we just can't go over budget, so three motorcycles equals one car, I figure, so. Yeah, my answer is uh, do what I say, but not what I do. Um, but uh, if you have more than six cars, you're in the car business, um, whether you like it or not. I mean, think of that, it's six times four or five tires, uh, you've got six batteries. Your weekends are pretty well taken care of uh, at least one month a year uh, just to maintain them. So I think that's, that's part of the, you know, that, that should be part of the, the figuring out what you're going to do. Um, hoarding is a lot different than taking care of cars. Um, I think that, you know, I'm trying to make my mantra into less cars, better cars. Uh, it's not working at all. Um, <laughs> but I think that, you know, for a lot of people when they reach a certain age, um, that becomes something that becomes more realistic because your weekends or your time off is more important and, you know, there's only a, a limited number of weekends all of us have left and when you get close to the age where you start counting those weekends, then you, you realize that, you know, maybe that trip that you've been putting off is more important than having a barn full of stuff that needs and needs and needs, so. You take all the fun out of it. Well, geez. I knew there, there was a table between us for some reason. I, like I said, this is do what I say, not what I okay, do. All right, I, all right, all right. Good thing. Okay. I, you know, all right, I, we're back at if, it, Yes, if we were members of Avani Owners Anonymous, I'd be Dave. And it's been three weeks since I bought an Avani. So, uh, you know. Allison, I think you have someone there. Yeah, all the cars have been skyrocketing except the Dino. It went from 400 to 300. Any thoughts on that? It's not every car that's skyrocketing right now. 2014 was the top of the market for a lot of cars. And um, what happens is, uh, you know, it's a classic case. Uh, you know, you have a Dino, let's say, and it's worth $85,000, $95,000. Then they go to $175,000. There are a whole bunch of people who say, I'm not selling my Dino, I'm not selling my Dino, I'm not selling my Dino, new cabin up north. I mean, you know, it becomes, you know, I could pay for that cabin at 175000 where I couldn't at, at 85000 And so a lot of people make the decision to sell. So more cars come on the market, and then, you know, after a while, it's musical chairs. The, you can't, every seat is filled, and there's more cars that uh, are coming on the market than, than, you know, than the market can handle, and then the price does go down. And I think we've seen a lot of that with, with a number of different cars. Uh, so it's not just the Dino, it's other cars as well. The 190 SL, perfect example. You rang the bell with the 190 SL. Everyone who had a 190 SL took it out and got it restored, some better than others, uh, because they'd, they'd literally gone from a $35,000 car to, what, did you get, like 285 or 285, something? 285, I think yeah. it was, yeah. And uh, so, you know, all of a sudden, there's a, you know, you can restore a lot of car for $200,000. But then that pipeline gets filled, and then that depresses the price. But that's what happens. You know, a Dino sold at auction once for, I think, $675,000, and all of a sudden, everybody's Dino was worth six seventy-five, dollars And it just can't be. I mean, it was just a fluky thing. And the market is corrected slightly. I mean, you know, you guys publish that constantly. If we look at the uh, Hagerty Price Guide, you're going to see the market goes up and down. It's, it's what happens. Daytonas were 
a million, two, million, three for a coop, and they came down to six or seven, now they're back up to eight. So it all depends on uh, the quality of the car and, and how many people want them. And with the Dino specifically, we were just talking to a dealer a couple weeks ago who said that the Dino is one of the hottest cars that he can stock right now. So yep. um, when they do come down in value, they start to become attractive again. So they have a tendency to just go in cycles. Wayne, you, you may have moved the needle on the 190 SLs, but you kind of created a market for Fiat Jollies a few years ago too, I think, didn't you? Yeah, Fiat Jollies and Renault Jollies. I was just talking with Jeff, uh, um, and, and now I have three Renault Jollies. Who needs one? I have three. So, you know, anybody wants to buy a, a, a Jolly, we, we have them in stock, ready to go. We, we got I see a gentleman with the Statue of Liberty mic up. <laughs> My name is Mark. I'm visiting from Austin, Texas. I wanted to do two plugs and then a question. Um, I'm a retired used car dealer. 13 years ago, I bought a Lamborghini Herma. Um, I saw a classic car TV show that didn't even address that car. It was a special just on Lamborghinis. I paid $16,500, sold it eight months later for $25,000 on eBay. 10 years later, I saw one turned down for $150, and boy, do I kick myself for not having kept that car because mine was a lot nicer than the one that didn't sell. Uh, I wanted to address Jeff for just a minute. Um, if you have not been to the Lane Motor Museum, it's got to be on your bucket list. I'm 58, I've been to a lot of car museums. It is by far the most unique place I've ever been. If you can pull any strings and get into the basement, you will see cars you didn't even know existed. Um, I'm a, the other thing I wanted to share, which may surprise some of you, there are 30 car clubs around the world that are part of a group called LCCI, Lambda Car Club International. All of the members are gay. We had our Memorial Day Grand Invitational in Nashville this past uh, spring, and we were privileged to see the Lane Collection, and again, you gotta see it. Uh, my question for any of you is where do you see the market going, and do you have anything in particular you would recommend investing in or avoiding? Thank you. Um, what I tell my clients uh, all the time uh, when, when we're purchasing cars uh, and, and setting up collections, buy what you like. Don't worry about the price. I mean, we're here talking about this stuff today and, and sort of trying to educate, but having a lot of fun with it. It's not about price. It's, it's about what you like. Um, the, if the world goes to zero tomorrow financially and the computers come up and everything's zero on a computer, you better like what's in your garage. You better not have bought something that you said, well, I gotta buy it. I don't really like it, but I gotta buy it because it's a good investment. Just buy what you like. You know, the, the, that's a question I get constantly. And uh, uh, you know, I, I, I have to triple down on what, on what Wayne just said. If you don't like it, it's not gonna be any fun owning it. It's never gonna get any better. Um, the other thing is to, I always say to expand your horizons. It's not the car that you grew up with that you might want to buy or you might want to think about buying. It might be from a generation or two after your age. Uh, because if you look at what happens, cars do age out somewhat. Your 40s car is not worth as much as they were a number of years ago. 50s cars are at that point now. And the next will be 60s cars. Um, you know, there are always exceptions to that. I mean, you know, there's, there's special cars that, that kind of you know, that, you know, 300 SL, I think we could be talking 50 years from now, and it'll still be a very, very special car. Um, but the, the thing is to always expand your horizons. We used to think that a classic car was something that was 25 years old or older. Um, now people think of, of special cars or classic cars or special interest cars. They're building them today, and it might be something that is a week or two or a month or five years old. Uh, so, you know, that's something to keep in mind from the investment standpoint. But if you don't love it, you're never going to love it. Um, also, keep, take good care of the car. Keep the best records you can. Write the car's story. Um, you know, even a bad traffic accident becomes a great story 20 years on after the car has been fixed. Uh, so, you know, it, all that stuff is important. Uh, but, but think outside the box. Don't just think of the cars that you grew up with or whatever. You might want to expand that range. And you also could think about going back, like brass era cars. We always thought they'd be worth nothing. And the high horsepower brass era cars are some of the most sought after cars out there right now. So, I think uh, this panel is a perfect example of, so we have Mr. Avante here. Um, you know, an unusual car. I have unusual cars. Jeff and I were just talking today. We're Davis owners. They made 13 Davises in the world. 
um, we have each one. So we like unusual cars, and Jeff is like the primo guy <laughs> that likes unusual cars because he's got about every unusual car in the world in his museum. So if you get a chance, I, I hope I'm going there in, in just two weeks for my first time. So. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. You know, buy buy what you like, and then also, uh, you know, buy a car that suits your needs. So, like, if you like to drive it, you live out in the country, or you have to get on the interstate. It's it's like my MGTF. When I was a kid growing up, you know, the speed limit was 55. I drove the thing across the country. I was comfortable with that. No seat belts. You know, now it's you know it's 40 years later, and there's semis. Everybody's driving 75 and 80 on the interstate. There's a lot more traffic. So, you know, it's, I wouldn't be excited about driving my TF across the country. But then also, I've known people that, I mean, I had a friend that um, he, he liked, he was a graphic designer, and it was all about the looks and the polishing. I would go over to see him on the weekend. He had an MGB GT, and he would spend all weekend polishing the radiator. I mean, that's, he loved to polish. He was scared to death to drive it because he had no mechanical skills. He would drive it once a month to the grocery store and he would park it like way out in the back away from all the cars, right? He'd come out of the grocery store and somebody would be like, just stop by there to look at it, not parking next to it. But he would like run out there, oh my God, don't get close to my car, you might scratch it, you know? So, I mean, there's people that are drivers, there's people that are polishers, some people live in the city, some people live in the country, so there's, there's a lot of things to consider about, and if you're not mechanically inclined, I mean, I, I tell people if you're not mechanically inclined, don't buy, buy a British. car that's real reliable, you know? <laughs> um, uh, don't buy something that breaks every time and then you can't find somebody to fix it and you, you want to drive it and now you're frustrated and, and blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of things to take in consideration. I think we've got time for one more question, and I hate to say that, but we have a, a time constraint on the room. So right there, sir. Yes, I have a question. How do we enthuse younger folks to create the passion because I think we some I agree that you should buy what you like but there is uh, this underlying value of vehicles that is going to go nowhere if there's nobody to buy them and uh, they're also deprived of what I think is a real exciting hobby uh, how do what successful efforts or what can we do to enthuse a younger generation to come up behind us because I now look at younger meaning anything under 50 when it comes to this kind of a vehicle? Well, first, first off, I think it's real important to teach young people how to drive standard shift. If nobody knows how to drive a standard shift car, it's all over. Um, if, you, if you can't drive something that you just bought, why do you want it at all? So Haggerty does a great job with teaching young people how to drive standard shift cars and their driving experiences. Um, and, and let young people sit in the car. Let them come up to it and, and, and get in. Let them start the engine. Um, the most informative years of, of, and we shape young people's lives is 12 to, to 18 years old. That's when they absorb so much. And if, if they have one great experience in a collector car um, and during that period of time, it will grow and grow. They may not show it until maybe they're in their 30s. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I think, also, I recommend if a young person has, let's say, a, a couple of thousand dollars and he wants to buy uh, his first collector car, and nothing to say wrong about Mustangs and Chevelles and Camaros and that stuff, but I'd be buying the weirdest, unusual car in the world that everyone will see it. I'd buy a Gremlin and, 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 and drive it to car shows. Everyone will come and talk to you if you own a Gremlin. But if it's just another Mustang, and nothing wrong with Mustangs, but it won't create that interest, and that's what it takes, is being able to be involved and talk to people and, and grow your interest in automobiles. So I think there, there's definitely hope, but we have to help young people. And this, this isn't a really popular thing to say, but I, you'll never find a do not touch sign on any of my cars. Um, I think it's really important that, you know, and following through with that, you know, the generation that I'm in and the generation before me went to these car shows and they brought home these bowling trophies, these god-awful bowling trophies, and you know what happens when you sell the car. They go in the trash can or they go in the trunk, and then the guy who buys the car takes them in the trunk and then throws them in his trash can. Um, you know, we, we've been chasing after these things for a long, long time, and I think it's really time that we reconsider the do not touch signs on our car. There's certain, look, if you own a Duesenberg and you just spent $85,000 to have the thing repolished, basically, yeah, I get that, but if you've got a Mustang or a Corvette like I do, uh, you know, I, I had a kid, I've said this too many times, but I had a kid 
a mom and a kid at a, a Cars and Coffee, and the kid came over and he put both his hands on the back of my Corvette, and mom was all freaked out, and I'm like, no, it's okay, it's, that's fine. I said, you know, I know how to, I've got a hose, I can, you know, I can wash the car. And I said to the kid, I said, hey, you want to sit in it? And he said, yeah, I mean, you know, whatever. And he lit up, and I opened the door, and he stood on the, uh, on the seats, on, on the front seat of the car. And mom, again, freaked out, and I said, my fat ass is going to do a lot more damage to that leather <laughs> than, than, than those two little feet. And I mean it. And I think it's really important we keep that in, in perspective as well. So That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much. I think this is one of these seminar topics we've proven. I think we could have gone another half an hour and done more slides and had more time for Q&A, but uh, we had some limitations today. Um, thank you all for coming. If you want to have more information on what cars are worth here and there, uh, you can go to Haggerty's website, va uh, haggerty.com valuation tools. It's an incredibly uh, deep amount of information there. Um, the Haggerty website also has all our um, media content information, links to YouTube channels where we do all kinds of fun stuff and certainly our insurance products. So thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you.